are setting a precedent. Um, what I mean by that is, in the last 50 years, when musicians retire or they're no longer with us, the music isn't heard live in concert. Unlike classical music, which stays with us, um, even though those musicians, those composers, are no longer with us. Do you see this as just something for Frank's music, or is it a precedent for other people to see, for the live music to stay going for hundreds of years into the future? Uh, well, you know, I think it really just depends on where you're coming from uh, musically, because uh, there's not many people that have a, a catalog like Frank's music. I can't think of anybody that's really that, that similar to, to Frank. So with the orchestra that, uh, you know, reference that you have in there, his music really was uh, conceived in a way to use a rock band as an orchestra or in fact use an orchestra. So he does fit more into that template uh, for his music to, to be carried on into the future more so than Britney Spears, you know. So it's, it's uh, I'm sure that uh, she's gonna have decades of fans, but you know, it's a different way to present it, you know. <laughs> I don't think you're gonna, uh, have the same situation, but it, I think live music is, is somewhat lost on, on a younger generation to a degree in the sense that so much has been uh, prefabricated. Most people have these computer programs, everybody's using the same equipment for everything, and, and a lot of the, the music that gets written for modern things with the new equipment is, is almost the same as when you're using word processing on a computer, because you can just take musical snippets and edit them and move them around and call it composing. And, and that's what happens a lot. So uh, there's there's already pre-recorded snippets where people actually steal things from records and then they make their own song and say, hey, I'm so professional. But you know, the, the thing is, when you're playing live, uh, that's, that's a, a time for experimentation, and a lot of times people take a live situation and say, I gotta make it just like the record. So much so that everything's done to a click track, they have the background vocals flown in off the computer, everything's set up on a grid so all the lighting is done at the exact same time. If somebody pulls the plug, you know, I mean, show is over. <laughs> you know, there's, there's just, there's, there's less uh, familiarity, I think, uh, for, for bands coming up now uh, to give themselves an opportunity to uh, make a more interesting arrangement and, and make something happen different in a live situation versus their recording. It just, I haven't seen a lot of those kind of elements uh, appear in the same way that they have in the past for other groups and certainly for, for Frank's music. You know, he really used the live medium as a, as a place to, to you know, make the songs have a life of their own. You know, he, he rarely, if ever, would play a song exactly like it is on the record. Okay, I, question I just want to add something to, a little bit of something on the hand Dweezil, uh, to what Dweezil is saying, and that is that um, Frank uh, always said, anything is possible depending on your budget. So for him, Every opportunity to create music was as though it was a symphonic situation. And it, um, you could take any uh, two instruments and turn it into a symphony, depending on how you layered it, what you did with that information. So he was never making a distinction. You know, oh, this is rock, and this is that, and this is something over here. Everything to him was one composition all the time for whatever it was all the way through his entire career. And the other thing is that I think the reason why this music will continue into the future, largely because of Dweezil's efforts to remind people that there are musicians out there that, you know, they want to be excellent on their instruments. And, you know, when you do that, you may not be a composer. And if you're a musician and you want to be the most amazing trumpet player or the most amazing cerusophone player or the most amazing violin player. Guess what you need to showcase what you do? You need composers. And there are very few real guys like that, because most of these guys are for hire and they make film music, and it's in support of the emotional content of a movie. I mean, if Frank had lived, I think you would see movies would be 
very different if he had lived long enough to have the kind of budgets that he deserved for his music. So thanks to Weasel and the guys on the stage and, and all the other groups that you're going to see here, you know, that are playing this music. You know, I mean, thank you to all of them. <laughs> um, I have a question for, for Jeff uh, and also for Scott. Um, obviously, working with Frank, it was a lot of hard work. Um, how much fun was it? How much fun? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> now, now, all these notes aside and this heaviosity aside, that's Scott's department. But fun is my department. And uh, just in looking at the VPRO film for the first time in its entirety that was made in 1970, I believe it was made by some people from Holland, uh, I was just struck by how happy Frank was. I mean, not that he wasn't happy later with other scenarios, but it was just a blast. I mean, we thought the future was going to be, uh, you know, a little less conservative than it turned out to be, especially in the States. But uh, it, I was just struck by the fact that it was uh, the ultimate expression of freedom. I mean, he had people for whatever he saw in me, something that could coalesce with what he was doing. But it was to hear him laugh. I was just talking to Toddy Vega and Ali yesterday, and we were both agreeing, or all three of us agreed. I mean, just the laughter that was there, and uh, you know, just going around Europe with those guys, I mean, it was insane, but in a good way. It was just joyful. I mean, you had to be in tune, don't make a mistake, don't be on weed, you know, whatever. I mean, it was very stringent in a way, but he was not only, I mean, Frank was a Sagittarius, and I don't think he was in astrology, and you don't think of his, him as someone that's like, peace, love, and crash pads, I love you, dude. But he was my friend, and I was part of a family, and it was just a riot, with a lot of great music, of course, attached, not by my making. I mean, you could get over there as a child of 20, like I was, and like, well, I'm in Europe, and you know, you forget the years of work that the guys, and I'd like to mention some of them now, Ray Collins, Billy Monday, Ian, who couldn't be here, who was my concierge into the group, and I learned, like, uh, and in your dreams, you can see this, so this is what that's one of the first things I said, what are you playing in? What is that? He says, well, these are some of the songs I have to show you. And it was like, one, two, three, one, two. And I'm like, wow, that's weird. Dee, dee, dee. So I learned it, you know, and, and the clusters in D minor of uh, Green Jeans. And I've got all sorts of stuff I can rattle on for hours, you know, a couple pints and we can hang out. But <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. And uh, I just saw Dweezil, oddly enough, uh, this is a bit off the track, but I had an interface with the brand or the clan, and my nephew is a big fan of Dweezil. And uh, to humor him, I went down to the Moore Theater in Seattle, and we went up in Dweezil's dressing room. Uh, I'd called Gail, and lucid, kind, wonderful guy uh, that I'd known since he was a pup, because my daughter was born the same year. And uh, just to get, bring that around in a circle, uh, it was just, on the fun basis, you know, you had to know, I mean, I'm not known, I'm in the sort of, uh, as Dweezil makes these motions, I'm doing it now too, uh, the vaudeville era. I mean, uh, let's put it this way, when Frank said, I'm gonna get the turtles in the band, I said, man, don't do that, that's, the, that's a dumb idea, you're iconoclastic, you're on the edge, you're on the outside, this is a pop. And luckily I didn't listen to them, because they were a riot, and I'm Ainsley, and when you're in there with George Duke, and Ian Underwood, and Frank, I mean, you must be doing something right. I mean, I didn't have the chops or the acumen or harmonic sense that I have now, but I learned a lot of it by playing with guys that were super heavy, way heavier than me, but you always try and muscle them, you know, like uh, one day, George was <clears throat> goofing around at rehearsal, and this was pre-midi, so it was Wurlitzer's, and it was, uh, you know, very analog sounds that he had Rhodes and Wurlitzer and Brown Wurlitzer, and he was playing Pygmy Twilight, but we hadn't started rehearsing yet. So we completely reharmonized it, just goofing around. 
you know, like, uh, be my, I'll tell you the chorus later, but it was, I went, what the hell are you doing? Show me that. And he goes, feel it, man. Just feel it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the real heavy guys like him, he would show me eventually, but they, they're kind and, and they'll, you know, just feel it, man. I'm doing it. It's, it's hip and heavy. And he's, it's Frank's thing, but he was kind of goofing around with it. But to be with those guys and to have the experience, my entree uh, into the music business uh, through Frank, who I met in Seattle in 1968, uh, and he came backstage and, and said, what's the deal? I got a new record company and stuff. And I can tell you all about that joke. But to, to circum circleize the thing I was saying, if that's a word, it was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs>